product. Because if you, if you take... Because a very common design element that we work with is um, five, five pieces on a wire. You have a central element, two caps, and then... I don't know you call those outer ones. Side beads. Side beads. Those little teeny guys at the ends. So you have those five pieces. Now, to make a different product, you can change the two caps. The two caps could be, you could substitute maybe some of the uh, rainbow wood instead of the metal caps. You just decide to try the rainbow wood. It's the same molecular form. You still have the same five beads, but now it looks different. It is not essentially different, but it looks Notice different. That right, so now it gives you a, full width a of your screen. organized approach to unraveling the chaos of all potential designs so that you can sort your way through it without having to confront utter blank canvas every time you approach the table. Yeah, that is so important. Um, what Claude is describing is actually called the Sane Man's uh, Guide to Coppersmithing. And what this technique allows you to do is to have a... Uh, an obedient, seriously, this is important, an obedient, predictable, regularized, sustainable series of experiments which follow logically from beginning to end. Meaning that the preceding experiment sets up the conditions for the present experiment. And this happens, this proceeds in an orderly fashion. It's so important that you understand this. Um... One of the great champions of logical investigation um, was an English writer who wrote a mystery series about a character named Sherlock Holmes. All the rest is not important. I'll tell you what is important about it. Holmes proceeds his investigation, with his investigation, in an orderly fashion. Proceeding to the next logical step, next logical step, eliminating all possibilities reducing the equation down to one single possibility, one single unknown, one single thing, where that can only be. All the other things are eliminated by the process of elimination, but that's all. You can't eliminate the same thing twice and call yourself a logical investigator. And when it's been eliminated, you stop considering it as a possibility. That's right. Colombo, another detective, had a, well, he had a more complex approach than the one I'm going to give you now, but these are two aspects that you'll find in almost every episode. When he enters a scene, a crime scene, there's two primary questions he asks himself, or the writers have him ask. What is here that was not here? What? So what's in the scene now that previously was not in the scene? Or the other question is, what used to be in the scene that is now missing? Yeah. That's and important. the answer to one or the 
other of those will typically <coughs> give him the clue he needs to find the culprit. Right. And you'll find that uh, there's a number, there are a number of, uh, of uh, mystery writers, Nicky Spillane and uh, some of the great writers of the 1930s who wrote for Dime Detective, for instance. Uh, they were, uh, their first consideration was uh, what anomaly is happening? What is odd about this scene? What doesn't belong here? What is, is, is there, is there a, 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 a spot of high color surrounded by faded color? That tells me that something was moved from there. Yes, uh, you'll see it often on the walls where yeah. there's a square that used or to be, rectangle yeah. of unfaded paint. Or oh. wallpaper. Wait a minute. There was a picture here. <laughs> yeah. There's now a picture missing. Yes. That'll happen. Uh, and the, the reason that... or or. It's not a picture, it's a mirror. And all the mirrors have been removed from the house. Why? Clearly, you're dealing with a werewolf. Or a vampire. Or the devil. Or a witch. Or some sort of supernatural evil creature. Who is not able to look at their own reflection. Wait a second, that describes my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> that explains the electrolysis bill I feared the scale I used to fear I'm serious I used to fear medical scales getting on a medical scale every time my mother got on one she'd scream <laughs> what the hell do those things do to you you know so I never step on one it's the electricity coming up through that's the right room. who knows what's going on there man I'll tell you Jeez, that's got to be painful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, by the way, I have hundreds of of um, hundreds of challenges for you, jewelry challenges for you. I, you're going to want to invent, it's, and it's fine. Go ahead and invent. But I've got specific challenges for you. Those challenges force you to do several things. One, they force you to confront the metal. You have to actually start mastering the metal. And in order to master, well, in order to finish the project, you have to master the metal. To make the project, you have to get, you have to, it goes hand in glove. See what I mean? Hand in glove, not hand in hand. Hand in glove. Hello? There's a reason why that, oh, never mind. These famous phrases get changed all the time. Hand in hand was hand in glove. Oh well. If you if you have memory that goes back thousands or millions of or, or trillions of years, you will remember that it was hand in hand, hand in glove, and now it's hand in hand. And the word "its" means nothing anymore. Nobody knows what that's about. H I apostrophe S H E R apostrophe S, his hers, makes sense, right? Put the apostrophe everywhere, or put it nowhere. <laughs> There's going to be two schools of thought, and they will clash at one point. They're going to meet on the plains of Kansas. They are have a, two mighty armies. The apostrophes, and the no apostrophes. Apostrophes that call the other end. and the righteous. The no apostrophes are the righteous. They're called the righteous, and then the apostrophes are the hated apostrophes. Oh, the because they believe words are perfect in their initial inspiration, and they do not need the ornamentation in order to be correct. Yeah. Puritans, <laughs> in a word. <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. Yeah, they'll be running around naked on the fields. Yes. 
<laughs> socioanthropology is part of our, seriously, socioanthropology is part of our tasking, part of our knowledge, part of our skills. Your knowledge of the various uh, cultures of the human race on Earth will be extremely useful to you when you're making jewelry and you don't have to go about directly studying those things. All you need to do is mess with these parts, these pieces of things, and they will start to awaken in you, reawaken in you those memories and those access points. It's not necessarily the memories. The memories are not going to come flooding in. What will happen is that now where it was blocked, it's not blocked anymore. You can look if you want to, but you don't have to. Nobody makes you look. But you can look. You can access those things. You will not believe it at first, but eventually it'll start to sink in that, oh, yeah, I do remember. I remember being alive in 1935. I was over in... And I got a letter from somebody. I was my sister-in-law in Rio de Janeiro. And this will all come out. And then you go, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but that, that, that can't be. That can't be. No, 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 no. So uh, eventually the that can't be the rejection will eventually die away. That's your friends, your peers, your loved ones telling you that you can't have those memories because you only have the one you, that's born, die, that's it, goodbye, that's end. So the organic self is always in denial of what the spiritual self knows to be true. The organic self it has only its existence. But that's pretty good, um, actually. The existence of the organic self is an, an element. The existence of it's an element. It's a permanent element. It always exists. It's always there. Honest to goodness, it's always there. That life is always there, available for you. As an element to string into a string of lives. You string your lives together the same way you string beads together. Oh, yes. It all works the same. It's all the same. It's all done with mirrors, you guys. You knew that. So. Um, if you follow the designs as given, you will automatically trigger various what are called openings or portals. We have a, a thing called the portal site, which we have not yet developed because we haven't yet actually introduced the concept of portalism, what portal is, portalizing is. Uh, but when you open various portals by triggering, is a, for instance, this is a trigger. This will work, serve as a trigger here. How much will it cost to build this? I don't know. How much can you sell it for? A hell of a lot more than it costs you to build it. How much exactly? I don't know. But I can tell you roughly, uh, it'll cost you roughly $85 to build that. That sounds awfully expensive. But it isn't awfully expensive because it uses very special caps called Dharma caps. They come from Tibet. And they're they're resin with copper coating. I don't know how they do it, but it's a resin with copper coating. It's really, really beautiful. Look at this. Those caps are just gorgeous. These caps, the, you're talking five, six dollars a pop. But you won't care. When you see the triggering agent, the triggering effect of this, when you wear this, this is a Zingo piece. Then I've combined that cap with normal green. These are normal light green, which is a perfect shade for this particular operation. See, it's your normals that actually determine the magical operation of the beads. So when you keep these green, which they were until you touched them. <laughs> I didn't say turn them purple. <laughs> Uh, when you keep them green, you achieve a result, which is to it it um, it generates 
uh, resonance with a healing angel, particularly healing angel. Call it the chlorophyll effect if you want to. So the chlorophyll green beads have that chlorophyll effect. That is to attract certain angels. St. Stephen also is attracted by that green, the help of St. Stephen. I don't know if you know who St. Stephen is, no? You Catholics should know, no? St. Martin, you know St. Martin? There's two St. Martins, no? St. Anthony, you know St. Anthony? Okay, so if you are if you are uh, happy with the the, uh, the Christian um, denotations of these various saints and so forth, it's okay. That works. I can tell you which saints are are drawn by the activation. See, when you when you put these down in their normal green, nothing, nothing. They're down on the. They're nothing, nothing. It's just room temperature. To them, I mean, whatever the temperature is, it's normal green. Now, you may get them, they might be purple when you put them down on the, on the, on, on your, on whatever surface it's at. Maybe you're in Alaska, Anchorage, and you got the window open. So you put them on the table, they're going to be purple or black or brown or something, really dark maybe. Perhaps you live in Needles, California. Out of the Mojave. Yes. Go looking for the, the Mojave Desert. All you see is Mojave, Mojave, Mojave. That's awful. Yeah, look it up under Mojave. <laughs> um, so you, at that point, they might be yellow. See, so when you wear them and they turn green, that is when they activate. Now, what is really interesting about this, I'm working with my, this is my friend Steve, I've known for almost 55 years now, I guess. Yeah, 55 years. And he has, he invented these things, and what he can do is any design that I want on here, I and mean, I have to get, you know, a, I can't get a few of them. I have, we have, uh, there's a minimum of a thousand beads otherwise there's no way he can manufacture because he's got to make he's got to tool up for each bead so um, he used a number of designs Persian designs Chinese designs that I happen to find very very useful and uh, I can have other designs made the ones that I've chosen out of the hundreds he has available, uh, I have about a dozen that I like that I actually can use. Um, and they're made of, it's in a resin kind of a material, so it's very light. They're large. They can be large. There's also smaller ones. And this one here, if I can turn this one yellow. This will be a high energy. This is also useful for this couple of other things I'll show you in a second. Yeah, there it is. I don't know if you can see this yellow. Yellow. <laughs> yellow. Okay. So, um, yeah, under yellow light, I might, I don't know, it might not <laughs> register on the camera. But anyway, I hope it did. Um, if you can turn those yellow, if you're wearing them and they turn yellow, you are in the presence of a radiating spirit. Radiating spirit is going to be something that's generated by the environment, typically, rather than uh, something which is trapped by the environment, such as a spirit, uh, a trapped spirit, or trapped uh, a ghost, basically, which would be a residual ghost. A residual ghost can be generated by the environment or can be trapped by the environment in the environment, not able to pass, not able to move. Uh, or to move on. So um, one way to free up those spirits is to use a variant of this, which is the open mala, which I call the spirit mala. The spirit mala is one where you are going to walk around, first of all, till you detect a spirit. That will be in red or orange. 
It will turn red or orange in the presence of some active spirit, a disembodied spirit. It's not going to be reacting that way to a person in, in flesh and blood, even if a spirit is inhabiting them and it's not going to react. If they're, if they're inhabiting a body, it won't react. It'll turn red or, or orange or kind of a burnt uh, sienna, something like that. Sort of, a, you know, like a reddish brown, uh, deep orange or red, a brilliant red, uh, or a, a kind of a, mm, let's see, not purple. Purple is good. Uh, purple is a good range. Um, but red or, or, or orange. And kind of a burnt orange, I guess, is the best way to describe it. That's actually your chief range right there, your burnt orange. <clears throat> and that tells you you're in the presence of a trapped spirit or an angry spirit in that particular configuration. And another thing it wouldn't say, that, but in this particular case, that's what it does mean. So what I do is I include instructions on how to read each of the color indicators on the mala. And I have different malas constructed for different purposes with different normals. And uh, I also have a set where, where the normal is, in three cases, the normal is blue, but they happen at different times and at different, under different circumstances that the blue occurs. Um, so the blue is in the range in a different place. Can you explain how that happens? How you shift spectra? Um, Just, you know, like... Well, the shift can happen um, either like a red shift in a star where when the light is originally emitted, let's say it's a nice yellow, but as it's traveling toward us, if the star is moving away from us, that causes the frequency to appear lower, which means that it's shifted toward the red, because red is a lower frequency than uh, yellow would be. You have ultraviolet on the high frequency ed edge and infrared on the low frequency edge of what's visible. Some people can see a little tiny bit into the infrared and a little tiny bit into the ultraviolet, but really those are the, the two ends. We can see everything above infrared and everything below ultraviolet, depending on your particular biological makeup, you'll see a different, uh, different degrees of reds and blues and greens and orange. We don't all see the spectrum the same, if you haven't figured that out. I mean, everything from the, from the obvious colorblind to some folks just see when they look at something that has red, and blue, and green, the green stands out more to them. To their eye, even if it's equal amounts of red, blue, and green, they'll see more green than you might see. You might see more red than somebody else sees, or maybe more blue, just because of how your eyes happen to work. Those, those differences are not indicators of disease. They're not indicators of wealth accumulation techniques. They're not indicators of, you know, how to propagate the species. So we tend to ignore those, but they are there. If, if you had any way of communicating effectively enough that you could actually discover it, I don't know how you would. Because when you're looking at something, how are you going to reference that you're actually seeing it differently? That'd be very, very difficult. Well, 
I don't know that. How would it? How would you? How would you? How would we discover that when you look at the same thing? Yeah, but that can be an artifact of language, and they f can, in fact, look the exact same to you. But the way you're phrasing it is that to you it looks. It's very difficult. You actually have to have a glimpse of of what they're of what they're seeing. It's just it's not as as um, apparent as you might think. Um, now, when Ichi was talking about uh, challenges, we should, you know, take note of the challenges that we've already been given. Um, one obvious challenge is the paddles. You know the little paddles? Loop at one end and then the little flat, flat, flat at the other end? That's a challenge. And it's also a kata. You know, like in martial arts, a form to be followed and learned and practiced. With uh, martial art katas, it's assumed that you don't do it one time. It's assumed that it's a form that you practice as a form because there's advantage to practicing the form, that it has something to teach you past the initial memorization and the initial uh, adjustment to duplicate it, that there's more than just duplication that's going on there, that somehow going through that form has additional benefits. That's a fortunate aspect to our common understanding of martial arts kata is because it then it allows us to communicate this notion that there's more than memorization, there's more than getting the sequence down, and there's more than just being able to do it the same way as you were shown, that there is an advantage to going through the form. And every time you make a paddle, even though it's only one small part of what you do when you're making an earring or ear wire, for example, or, you know, an earring, it's only one small part, but as you do that paddle, you're now doing a little mini kata. You're doing a mini form. It has its own beginning, middle, and end that goes with the paddle kata. The mystery bead. Um, Jim, I don't know if you saw that presentation. Do you know what the, what the mystery bead is? Um, well, that's the, that's the copper coil with the two little ends that, that well, it was on one of the, because he, he showed that one earring that was a simple loop with the mystery bead hanging down at the bottom. Well, that mystery bead is a, another kata, a little mini form form in the martial arts sense, like Tai Chi form. It's a mini form that you, again, you will perform that as part of making an earring, but it is a form in itself. And every time you perform it, that's part of a uh, tradition, your tradition. And you can add up all of those times, whether you do them in series or do them when they're required to make another bead for an earring. 
it's another run through and there is again an advantage to going through that form to do that kata there's some benefit that accrues accumulates by going through that one of the obvious benefits obvious if you have had this experience if you haven't had this experience this won't occur to you um, Jim do you remember have you made paddles do you know what the paddles are you've made loops though right now each loop is also a little mini kata little mini form it's just a thing onto itself an ear wire is a little mini form but you've done the loop so we can talk about the loop as you're doing the loop all of the loops you've done are connected so as you do one loop you in essence are doing all loops in that you have access to all loops all loops that you've done this lifetime and all loops that you've ever done so you can connect up doing that kata in each one of these katas allow you to have that same connection as you look at your jewelry making you'll see that there's um, quite a few little mini katas that we go through speaking of which I'm going to do a video on how to use a gem scoop as most people don't know how to actually hold one or use one so I'm going to do that not now but I'll do that in a little while once we get our our camera cord back. Ivan, where's our camera cord? Um, so we're missing our, our camera cord? Yeah. Well, he supposedly went to pick it up, but he might have not. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I could. I can tell you how to make a million dollars from the blog that I posted this morning. Very simple, actually. <clears throat> Take any one of those, any one of those projects, and print it on a piece of paper in color, in color, where the picture of the piece is um, on the front, if, if folded in half, you see. So eight and a half, eleven piece of paper folded in half. And so on the front piece, on the front is the photo of the piece. Then when you open it up, the photo is repeated a little smaller with the full instructions underneath it, printed lengthwise. So, see? Then the back has instructions on how to get to your classes and how to get to your website and all that kind of thing. And, and any information you want to give at that time about your jewelry classes, what they cover, and so forth. The jewelry classes are going to be step by step. I'm going to create the classes for you so that you'll give them only one problem at a time. I've given you with these things just something to work on for the next week or so, but believe me, it has to be simple and a step at a time and a very, very slow, easy grade of, of, of learning. It can't be you know, a, a big learning curve. It doesn't need to be. To be fun, it can have just one single experiment a week. You come once a week to the, cl to the jewelry club. It's called a jewelry club or class or whatever it is. Actually, it's going to be your study group. You'll be forming a study group from this group, but it will only be composed of the people who are interested in going further than just the jewelry. You'll have to actually make an opening there somehow, explain to you how to do that at some later date. But you're going to just form a group right now of people who are interested in making this jewelry with you. 
Stone Age jewelry in the Stone Age manner, going out and selling it and having a good time doing that. And with the, you know, that's what they do with the money is spend it, <laughs> you know, enjoy. Um, <clears throat> and um, get some economy flowing to their hands. At the same time, you are sending out these designs as seeds. Seeds of awakening, seeds of tickle. They just tend to annoy people until they finally do something about their lives. Some people, it doesn't, they don't annoy at all. They, they think they're really cool. And other people, it just kind of bugs them and bugs them until they finally do something, something to actually use the lives that they have been wasting. Now, the thing about a dog whistle is that when you blow a dog whistle, it's a frequency that non-dogs, they don't hear it. That's right. Only the dogs will respond to it. And That's right. With this right. jewelry, it's putting out a tickle that only those that should respond will even hear the tickle. Thank you for making that point. We were talking about that. I totally forgot to make this point. Thank you. The, uh, the, the design of the necklace plus the designs on the beads, particularly the caps, are attuned to a particular frequency. <laughs> to a particular frequency. That frequency is like a dog whistle to a human. And a dog whistle to a dog. And a dog whistle to a bird, to let's say a canary or something. Because each animal hears in different ranges of the spectrum, of the sound spectrum. And even different parts of it, actually missing chunks as well, not hearing in certain frequencies, because you don't have to. It, the way that adaptation works, adaptation of species, the way that it works is that whatever you don't have to <laughs> develop, you don't develop. Whatever you don't have to, whatever you're not forced to, whatever you're not pushed to develop, you don't develop. Why should you? because you're going to have the least amount of effort to achieve the result. That's nature's way. It is actually, it's part of entropy. And believe it or not, neg entropy is the enemy. It doesn't sound like it should be, but the clustering effect, the zigzag and swirl, is the enemy in a sense. And yet you're using the enemy's power to overwhelm it. But in the center of all of all of those points, there's a black hole, tiny black hole, but a black hole nevertheless. You want to avoid that. So that's the identification. You want to avoid identification with it. So you're passing these things, you're making them and passing them along, passing them on and passing them on. They're your children, you know, but there's you can you have to be able to let go of the of your creations and this is another thing but letting go if you read Lord of the Rings really read it I don't mean the movie the movie's cool okay but it's not the book it's not the same thing get the red book of Westmarch the big fat book the big red book single book single volume it's findable and and as you read into that um, I'm going too far afield there. Let's just go back to well, I, I, how to I, make a million dollars, I should say, because that is, that is the point. How to make a million dollars from this, very simple. You, 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 uh, you take the photo, as I said, and you put it on a piece of paper where all you can see is the photo. You get what I'm saying? Plus the title of the piece, Sumerian, uh, blah, 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 or tribal, da, 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 Ashanti tribal, uh, or Maori uh, tr uh, ceremonial piece, whatever, right? Something like that. Now, uh, 
and, and but all you see is the photograph and the title of the piece. And then inside the thing is how to make it. Okay. Now, tote up the number of pieces that are needed for this thing. Pieces of wire that are needed. Uh, pieces of turned wire that are needed, that are needed to, you need to turn on your screwdriver, your miniature screwdriver to make your tubulars. The number of hammered out pieces that are needed to make the paddles. The hoops, the drops, the cage, whatever it might be. Now, Pre-make those for people, except don't hook them up together. You beat out the paddles, you do all this stuff for them, basically, except you don't hook them up, so they're all, um, two, they're all separate parts. They're made, but they're separate parts. Unassembled. Unassembled, right. And you set up a class where they assemble these things into whole workable things. Of course, they'll butcher the fine work you did in order to get them together. They will totally butcher these things. But you're going to show them how to make inexpensive Christmas presents, and you do it in a way that they can actually accept and make it work. Now, here's another way you can do it, which is to go to the very simple drop the technology, which I show at the very beginning, one of the very first of the things I put up yesterday or this morning. Now, in this case, it's a real simple kind of bead, a bead that almost anybody could make with very few tools, yet with the addition of things like hammering effects and paddles and hoop flyers and side mounts and tri mounts, you could make a very, very intricate Byzantine piece from the same tools, the same materials as you make a simple drop. Just a simple Ashanti drop. That's all it is. That simple Ashanti drop is the key to it. That's like that's like the that's like the French drop. The Ashanti drop. Because what it is that you have to learn is how to make a loop. Two kinds of loops. One kind of loop is the 16 gauge heavy duty loop. You just turn the material, turn the metal and leave it like that and make sure that you make a nice tight fit so something doesn't, doesn't slip off out of that loop. See? Make sure that it isn't togged to the left or togged to the right. If it is, it'll cut something. So make sure that doesn't happen in the first place. Because if you fix it, you'll scar the metal. Everything you do to fix that metal is going to scar it more and more, deeper and deeper. It's Jerry Lewis with the sculpture. The more you fix it, the weirder it gets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, there's... Um... I blogged that some time ago. You can take a look. I think I did Jerry Lewis. I don't know. In the bellboy. Yeah, and then that, that scene is up on YouTube. It is absolutely, I mean, I don't like Jerry Lewis or his films, but I do like that scene. It is very funny. Giving people an opportunity to learn one thing at a time is very good. And you can do that with the, if you take the ear, ear ring, 
that's, you know, like five paddles, a loop, and an ear wire, first class you give them all of the pieces and they assemble it. Look, Daddy, I made an ear ring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The second it, it, the, class. The what it is is called the illusion. This really is that we had this set up like this in uh, in a crafts college in, uh, <clears throat> in San Fernando Valley. We had a crafts college, College of Crafts. And uh, we set up the illusion, and then the second uh, class was the disillusionment. It was always called that. Well, a second class, you give them the ear wire, the hoop, and five little pieces of cut wire that they then get to put a loop on and then make a paddle. So now they're actually making a paddle, but they don't have to also at the same time confront making a hoop because that's, that's right. an extra complexity. So you've given them the ear wire and the hoop, and now they get to work on paddles. Or you give them the, the hoop, and the ear wire is complete. The ear wires are complete. Uh, the hoop is straight, so they have to make the hoop. You can, have the, you can have them make the hoop first, or make the paddles first. I mean, you, or I think the, the paddles because now they're they're banging. yeah the paddles are banging on something. Yeah, they're having Ooh, I'm fun. Doing stuff. Yeah, that's right. I, me make me make earring. <laughs> yes, that's right. Og, og make jewelry. You, you don't want just. You don't want you, you know you don't want just the calm and the and the, and the uh, serene in there. You want some people who are seriously disturbed enough to want to bang on some metal. <laughs> yes, bam bam. Hi. <laughs> My mom never let me play the drums, but now I can make money by hitting this thing, aggressing upon metal. Well, it helps you determine who to invite to the third class. Because if they come in with a five-pound sledge, then you know that you want to <laughs> you want to move them into some you other class. Have a repeating <laughs> loop of that same class. You just have. Well, that's Monday night. Oh, you have a Monday night class. That's the one where everybody's banging on stuff. Nothing. But it's all we do is bang on metal. <laughs> <laughs> our all our projects consist of bang, banged metal. Banged? Bing, bang, bung? It's banged. Banged, yes. Banged. <laughs> Do me then, banged. So, <laughs> um, which will create a lot of work for you, which is a good thing. Yeah. Because you'll be making all of the hoops and all the ear wires. <laughs> or if, you, if the ear wires are dicey, there's those wonderful um, stainless steel ear wires that are available. Now, should, so you don't have to confront that. Yeah, and if your promotions should screw up or something happens or, you know, people always, would they say, oh, I'll be there, you know. But that's not always true because shit happens. And so if shit happens and you don't have anybody showing up, you've got all these extra parts, okay? So what I do, what I would do, what I do, used to do is I'd have my, I'd have my shindig on Friday. And I would know for sure by Friday night, whether I was going to have anybody show up at the workshops on Saturday and Sunday, see. So if I didn't, I would go over to some of the, the uh, craft, well, not craft, we call them um, swap meets. So I'd go to a swap meet, and I had a particular place I'd set up and so on. But at, at that time, we didn't have those quick pop-ups. We went to uh, Big Five yesterday, and I looked at about ten different just to, to, so I could tell you which ones are about 10 different fast pop-ups, 10 by 10 feet, exactly the size you're going to get for your booth. That's all booth sizes now are 10 by 10 or, or units thereof, you know, multiples thereof. So uh, each, each unit is going to have a 10 by 10 booth, a 10 by 10 tent on it. That tells you the booth itself. That defines the booth. Within that, you have to find some way to set up so there's room for your customer to move around in that space, which means that you have to understand how to use the interior of those spaces. So you need one of these things handy. They cost typically anywhere from about $100 to $200, some of that range. Uh, average $160, bucks, i would say. 
And uh, I, these are also at Kmart. But you'll find at Big Five Sporting Goods, you'll find a huge variety of pop-up, instant pop-up tents that are quick builds. You just go, boom, it's up, it's there. Boom, it's down. It's nice. We The ones we first started with took four hours for four people to build each one. And we had something like 20 of these things. We set them up in a, in a, uh, in a uh uh, park out. Now that this is here's how you make your million bucks. I'll tell you. You find a parking lot somewhere. I see there's a parking lot for sale in town here, and I would buy it if I had the money. I I I would buy it because it's it's commercially zoned. It's in a fabulous traffic point. Everybody passes through. I don't care what you're doing. When you pass through town, you've got to go through here. You've got to go past here. And I would set up a swap meet, at least on the weekends, if every day if I could, set up a swap meet environment. But don't invite other dealers. You have one dealer. It looks like there's 27, there are 27 booths. But it's one, and you can have four, five, six, ten people working there. I just have four or five people working there. So you can, because people will try to maneuver you away from your merchandise and then they'll swipe it and run and that kind of thing. You know, you don't want that. So you want to have enough people there to man the booths. So you have it set up in such a way that it's called co-op style. So it looks, uh, I can explain this another time. Anyway, um, the point being is that there is a formulation for how to do this it's not just to kind of wing it oh no this when, is it, not something when it comes you time up. there is yeah there is a definite uh formula that works right this is the caravanserai a, a formula with, that was worked out years years ago by phil blecker he worked this whole thing out how to do this how to set this up amazing absolutely amazing and he does this he had a schematic a blueprint of how to set this whole dynamic up <clears throat> anyway, let me tell you how to make a million dollars from what I posted. You, you, you have a photograph of this item, and you have a bag that has the photograph on the front and inside, but you can't see what that is, are the parts to make that thing. The parts. Everything you need is in here. All you need is a plier, pair of pliers and a flush cutter. That's all you need to make this project. And it's only blank, blank, blah, blah, whatever the amount is. You know, and now it, this has to be cheap for you in order to offer this cheaply. And it, it can be complex, hard to make. It can be one of the things that I show, such as any of those things that I put up there this morning. That would be incredibly cheap for you to produce a kit that consisted of those things, and you could preclude the flush cutter by flush cutting all the pieces beforehand for the customer. And, get this, providing a very inexpensive very inexpensive pliers, needle nose pliers. You can get needle nose pliers online for as little as a dollar and a half. They're not very good, but they will bend the metal. They will do it for them. You can actually afford to give this miniature pliers away with every kit. That's all they need. That's all they need. See? 
because you have pre-done all the other stuff. Now, if it's something that has to be banged out, that's a different story that I don't intend you to do. Be banging out those things unless you want to. Hey, you know what? You want to sell earring kits really fast? Pre-bang all of the paddles. Just pre-bang the paddles. And while you're doing that, you might as well put the put the uh, the loop in on the top. So loop and bang the paddles. Make those pr- so you can actually have it as a separate unit. You put that out as a separate these for five extra dollars. You can have the pre-hammered paddles. That's only fifty cents a paddle. Hey, you you know that's less than a bead costs typically. And it's handmade. It's a handmade bead. It is a bead. It's called a pendant bead, actually. There are some very valuable phallus pendant beads from Egypt, ancient Egypt. There are also, I think they are also phallus beads from, but they are they're from Gilan. They are very, very prized and very, very hard to find. And there are also some pendant beads from Rome, lots of pendant beads from Rome. And again, those might be phallus, uh, phalli, uh, might be, I don't know. Uh, but they are they are uh, drops. And how they make them is very interesting because it's essentially what you're going to do with your metal which is they'll take the glass and they'll wrap it, they coil it, and then they drop it down like that. They coil it against itself and then drop it a bit. And then, of course, uh, pull the end off. There's ways of snipping the, the ends off of those things. So it comes out looking like a pea, like that, like a kind of a roundish pea. And uh, that sometimes they're flattened also at the bottom, things like that. That is a different bead entirely. But those are stamped beads. They're, they're coiled and stamped, or sometimes they're um, wound and stamped. They're called wound and stamped beads. Uh, there's others that are wound and stamped and coiled and twisted and cut and so forth. It's all kinds of techniques of drawing glass out into various shapes and compressing it into squats and put it, pulling it out into elongations and so on, all that kind of thing. Puff and this is uh, draw and puff, draw and puff, draw and puff, kind of those kind of beads also. Uh, Venetian beads are very amazing. Czechoslovakian beads, glass beads are very, very amazing, it's astonishing things. Um, How you handle these things is going to really make the difference for you. Anyway, so you can market the parts which cost you nothing, hardly anything. It's just wire in some cases. So just wire. See? And that's all you're selling is wire and the instructions. See? So I'm going to make up kits just like that. I'll show you how it's done with the ones I posted this morning. I'll make kits up that people can actually make those things, okay, with the parts that I send out, the parts I ship out. And uh, that is going to be one of the, I hope, one of the mainstays for our for our uh, community. I'd like our community to be producing things like that as a cottage industry and then selling those things on the market to people who like and appreciate uh, jewelry kits. And there's a lot of folks who do, who really like those things. And anybody who wants to hop on board of that, 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 uh, that particular train, you're welcome aboard. We need some help. We need all kinds of help. The help we need most is the promotion of said uh, jewelry kits. And so that is going to be your first job if you take it on, should you choose to accept it. 
Mr. Phelps, is um, to help us get the word out and get these kits out there and so forth, particularly uh, with the idea in mind of gift giving. And so somebody came up with the idea yesterday of, um, of uh, I think it was Ginger Rogers, but I can't, be sure, I can't remember for sure. On gift, you know, gift certificate. Yeah, was that you? I thought so. Yeah, she came up with the idea of gift certificates, which I think is, boy, what a terrific idea that is. So you have a gift certificate you give somebody, and they can choose which kit they want. So it's not a gift certificate. That's a kit certificate. Yes, it's a kit. Exactly. But it is a gift certificate that relates to a group of kits, all of which are the same price, $10. Nothing over $10. That's the boast. Nothing over $10. See, 5 and $0.10 cent store, Woolworths used to say nothing over $0.10. Cents. Nothing over a dime. See? Nothing over $0.10. Cents. That lasted for a couple of years. And then forget it. You know, that was in the middle of the Depression. But after that, when people were no longer depressed, forget it. You know, they were elated. During the elation, there was no such problem. You know, didn't have a cash flow problem. The elation, then the depression, then another elation, then a depression. Does it sound bipolar to you? It is a bipolar society. Somebody could write a book called The Bipolar Society. Just about the, it's about that, the, 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 exactly what happens. People get elated. They get carried away with their elation. They get so confident, and then something bursts their balloon and it can be the smallest, weirdest, daintiest little thing. This little dinky, twinky thing. Or it can be a big, crushing, horrible thing. But usually it doesn't take that much. And suddenly, oh, there's a depression. Everyone is so depressed that I must rush. And because it's bad times. Well, it's bad times is created by bad times be creating itself. It's people creating the bad times because they expect it to be bad it's bad because everybody expects it to be bad it's a mood swing and then there's an elation there's a depression then an elation the depression and they call it a depression or a recession when people become uncertain and afraid well they're always uncertain and afraid, right? So what does that mean? Well, it means that they, at that point, have no clamp on it. They don't really have any way of, of um, denying the depression or denying the, the oppressive bleakness <laughs> of their existence. And on that happy note. No, reality is a crutch for people who cannot face fantasy. In a way, think about that. I mean, think about, ah, ah, ah. but it's not, that's just, it's not that funny, but it really, it conveys something about the amount of stricture that you are holding, that you're, that's being held on you, the amount of tightness that there is, the amount of clenching tightness that there is. You need to let go of that. So these could be an amazing way to earn a livelihood. Amazing way to earn a livelihood. And more than that, to actually get seeds out there, especially the things that we'll be producing ourselves with these emo beads. The emo beads are the most amazing thing I've ever come across. It's a, probably the top product I've ever seen in beads, the emo beads. And I've combined those with, oh, uh, I've combined those with ancient beads of various kinds, and also with other historic beads besides ancient, also medieval beads. And uh, we get some very interesting results. So keep in mind those ghost hunter ideas because they will work. And this 
I also have a uh, um, a, a gripper that will work in the spirit radio using the emo beads if I can get them again. I'm going to talk to Steve and see if he can make them. He, he doesn't make them, but he did. He made them. He tried them, and they, they were a commercial disaster. He may still have some floating around someplace, or he may be able to retool and make it. We'll see. Anyway. Hmm? You were going to say? No. Well, it does bring us to a close, though. Doesn't it? I thought so. I got to tell you that I heard that in junior high school, and it, it had to do with Mickey um, shooting Minnie. Because because he was angry at her? No, because she was just fucking goofy. <laughs> Oh yeah, I did know it, but I'm very interested to know that it was Jazzy who sent that go that joke in. So Jazzy gets a no, he gets a he gets a prize, he gets a prize, and the prize will be sent to him at his present location. <laughs> and uh, well, I'll send it. I'll, I'll designate it to you momentarily what the prize is exactly. So yeah, it's worth doing. It's worth it. Thank you for the joke. Oh, it's good. And it was. A good, I hope you guys heard it because if you didn't hear it, well, too bad. I'm surely not going to repeat it. It's just it's a dreadful anti-Disney joke, and I'm not going to tell it. Anyway, <laughs> you have to be 21 or or 20 more, 21 or more, and that's just personalities. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I mean, you, you actually could turn that into quite a business, you know, you walk down the street and sell kits like that. I'm going to show you how it's done. It's very simple. I'll have it for you tomorrow. I know. People are selling their jewelry, and people here are also having the same experience that they are selling their jewelry. What's really neat is that uh, people are buying jewelry again, especially at the range of anywhere from, let's say, $10 to $35, and they love kits. Oh, my God, do they love kits. So we are, we are up to our eyeballs trying to get kits out there, and so I'm passing this on to you just as a word is to an idea. Just think in terms of selling kits to people. You know, can you imagine making these for only ten dollars? All you need is a pair of pliers, and you can sell them the pliers extra. You know, they make another two bucks on your pliers. Why not? You buy them like by twelve at a time. You know, offline, online. You know, and and um, for two bucks each. And they say, well, I've got these pliers for five dollars each, or four dollars each, or whatever it is. Make a couple of extra dollars there. And you carry a half dozen of those things with you. You should be able to make a half dozen sales a day. A day. I would say in a really good space, good area, you should be able to make a, a ten sales. Well, let's make it six sales an hour, about every ten minutes or so. It'll take about ten minutes to find another, you know, to conclude and find another customer and so on. So, and there'll be sometimes clusters of people, like two or three people will cluster around. This happened to me the other day when I was showing something. Two other people came in and looked and said, oh, hey, how cool.
So, yeah, we'll put together a beginner's kit, one, two, three, four, and so on, <clears throat> where each stage is covered. And also I'll be putting together a kit where it's uh, bonehead simple to get started, bonehead simple. It's for dum-dums, like the guitar lessons. It's for dum-dums. Where it starts out with, this is a piece of wire. And this is how we bend it. And now we have a piece of jewelry and so forth. And I know it sounds really ridiculously simple and ridiculously childish. But it isn't. It is part of the learning process to start from very simple levels and then work your way into more complex things. It's really better to do that. And so I recommend starting slow and starting simple and starting easy, just like fast draw. Just like fast draw. So, oh, yesterday I found uh, and purchased a, a hand, not a handgun, but a handgun style um, pellet gun, a gas pellet gun, <clears throat> that I'm hoping will be able to, uh, will draw from my my uh, holster so that I can fire it at a target. I got one of these little doingy, you know, the, the little pellet targets that captures the, captures the pellet and, and, and rotates. Because <clears throat> what I want to show is not just a fast draw from a holster, but also an accurate uh an accurate heart shot you see from the from the fast draw position which is where the gun is lowered it's not raised up you haven't got it up here you've got it from right from the holster and from the holster you shoot and you've got to have it a dead on at 10 paces 10 paces that's 30 feet that's a lot of room between you and somebody the average gunfight for instance, at uh, Tombstone, you know, the one at Tombstone, the OK Corral. But there's others, lots of others, thousands of other gunfights. Typically, they happened at about two or three feet range. And people missed. Because you can. You can miss with a handgun at a range of two or three feet. Honest to God. Especially a blunt, you know, one of the 38 specials. Those things, how that could go four feet off at about 10 seconds. It's way off, way off. There's just nothing to keep that thing in, in trajectory at all. So, um, anyway, gosh, it's very much off subject, I guess. <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> but I am planning on showing in the reincarnation workshop some of the fast draw techniques that will help you to recover those memories that are blocked, currently blocked, by things like shock, you know, seizure, uh, gunshot, gunshot wounds, things like that. You know, um, whoa, I'm dead. What happened? I don't know. Step on a rake? No, I had a gunshot wound. I said, mm, where's the exit? Well, do. Yeah, terrible. Entry wound looks like nothing happened. Yeah. So. Like when you show Wes your face, I knew that you had. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That was also junior high school, I think. Pretty much around 19, 1956. I remember that. Yeah, 56. That's when I heard that one. I can tell you where, too, in the playground. Yeah. A little, little carousel. Amazing. Yeah. Oh. Oh, let's show it because we discovered. We still have a stack of these prints. I had a suspicion we might, and we did a search. 
Barbara did a search and found this print, put it up in front of them, show them, yes, this is, I did this watercolor in 1964. They can't see it yet, I bet you. Oh, yeah, that's pretty far. No, here, put this up close. Put the, put the table up closer. Yeah, put the table up closer to the camera. Or put the camera, roll the camera in. There you go. That's it. There you go. Ta-da, ta-da. And this was framed by Faye White. Or framed for K. Uh, it was for, framed for Faye White. It was on, but but framed by Robert for Faye White. And that is a very nice framing job on this piece. This is a carousel, and I'll tell you the story about this briefly, and then I got to go. All right. <clears throat> In 1964, Peter Hirschfeld and I went over to drove over to um, Griffith Park. Uh, not actually with the same. We had the same idea. We went. We were at a uh, at a uh, watercolor class, and we both had the same idea to get this. Go over to this carousel in in Griffith Park. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> yeah. So. Uh, we didn't discuss it. He went in his car. I went in my car. We both ended up there at Griffith Park, and we saw each other wave. You know, and we, each one was doing different area, different uh, thing. But we were both painting the same thing. And as we're doing this, little by little, our whole class drifted in to the scene, and and so the, about thirty people from our watercolor class had drifted in and were part of this thing from L.A. City College, 1964. So the, the crowd around the carousel became a whole bunch of artists painting the carousel. It was a spooky scene. And um, we all brought our projects back, all our paintings of the carousel, and we, of course, had a, an exhibit showing these things where we slashed each other's pieces apart. You're supposed to do that. Well, you're supposed to, you know. Uh, critique, yeah, you critique, you slash, and you have to, because people have to, first of all, learn how to take criticism, so it'll happen. And more importantly, learn how to, how to work with that criticism where you you don't have to do what they say. Ah. <coughs> <One more. coughs> ah. Ooh. Sorry. Uh oh. <laughs> Some of those pieces dropped. Out of there, down onto the floor, I think. Here. That doesn't matter. It was, it was just for just a whole bunch of examples. Um. Pardon me. What was I? Yeah, but I was going somewhere. Oh, yeah, thanks. The carousel print. So, in 1964, 
I painted that thing and put it away for years. And in 1975, 76, something like that, something around there, it might have been as late as 1980, I don't know. Somebody decided, let's make this into a print. Now, the reason for that is because we had a printing house in Grass Valley that had just moved there, and they were art printers. They actually printed huge art color prints. That was really rare at that time. So for $2,500, we had this printed 100 copies or whatever it was. I don't know. Yeah, $2,500. It was a full color separation. And it's a 26, it's 26 uh, colors are totally in, are in the, the 26 actual colors and in the shades and so on. It's very subtle. The painting itself is very subtle. The printing is very, very responsive to that subtlety. And it looks exactly like the original. In fact, my parents had the original. Um, and it was framed up. And one of these pieces was put nearby. And they got confused about which one was which. It's, it's that good. It's really good. So it, 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 is, it is the original. It's as close to the original as you're going to get in a print. It's a full color print. And originally they were sold for, I don't know, Yeah, 100. Limited edition of 100, which included proofs. Yeah. It's signed and it is um, numbered, and they're an edition of 100. And there is a market price on this that actually does sell in the secondary market. But I was convinced we had some left over in a stack somewhere. And by God, we did. Stuck away in storage. I don't know how many we have, 20, 30, something like that. I don't know. But... Um, as soon as we can establish a price for those things, we'll post it for you, and we'll post the image so you can see what it looks like. It's very, well, evocative and, and um, warm. It's uh, got a warm feeling to it. Happy feeling, very happy feeling to it. And um, it, people who have had these in their homes, so it brings cheer into their homes. It brings some happiness and cheer into their homes. Now that's, I think, a good purpose for a piece of art. And it's one of the pieces that is, well, I'd say, stands out among the pieces that I made. Uh, uh, Heaven and Hell is one of them, and there are a few others. Very few of them stand out the way this watercolor, especially watercolors. Very few watercolors I've made some that are very spectacular and very some of them that are admittedly pretty. But this one is different. It's just different. There's something about it. I made probably a hundred watercolors of this carousel, but this is the one. This is the one. This is the print that this is the one we decided to to make into a print.
Okay, I gotta go. It's late, late, late. See you guys when tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon at uh, at four. If you have a mind to, it'd be nice to see you there. You're invited. <laughs>